Thank you. I want to welcome you to the Voices of Experience, Daniel's Signature Speaker Series. I want to thank you for attending this event and offer a special thanks to our event sponsor, U.S. Bank, for their support. Tonight, we're honored to have Roger Ferguson, President and CEO of TIAA, as our guest. In a few minutes, Daniel's College Dean Brent Kreid and Roger will sit down to discuss Roger's experiences and how they have molded his leadership style. We will also find out why Roger, in his own words, has the best job in the world. At the end of this discussion, we will have some time for questions from the audience. Before I invite these two gentlemen to the stage, I want to briefly share some TIA history and my personal experiences with that organization over several decades. My goal is to provide you some context about the TIAA organization and its leader, Roger Ferguson, whom you are about to meet. TIAA was created in 1918 in New York for the purpose of providing retirement income to professors. So they're approaching a milestone birthday next year of 100 years old. In 1933, Albert Einstein became a TIAA participant giving rise to the theory of relative performance. <laughs> Sorry, no more financial humor, that was it. So the company was formed to serve college professors. Now some of you may have run into a few college professors, some of you may be college professors. I thought about this clientele a little bit when I was preparing these remarks. Now, there's a lot of terms you could use to describe college professors, both individually and as a group. I've heard many of them myself individually. But when I think about us as a group, I think of skepticism. We're trained to doubt. We move very, very slowly to accept any fact. This is a quite interesting clientele when you think about TIAA asking a college professor, would you give me my money now, and I'll give it back to you in 40 years with a return? That's the genesis of this company. And I think it's important to remember that as you think about where they've come. Now, TIAA is a $1 trillion company. Under Roger Ferguson's leadership, they have achieved much of this growth. But in my view, they retain their close connections to the creative professions, higher ed, medicine, cultural organizations, and TIAA, importantly, in my view, retains some of those key characteristics of its early clients. So my thesis, tonight we're going to have two leaders on the stage whose organizations, the Daniels College of Business and TIAA, have a common ethos. They both have long track records of serving the greater good. That's an incredible opportunity, I think, to bring together these two organizations and have these two leaders whose personal careers embody that as well to share their thoughts with you. So, what personal evidence do I have to support my views about TIAA? I just offered you a thesis. Let me offer you a couple briefly. First, I've been a participant myself since 1988. So, Einstein in 33, Sicatello in 88. <laughs> you see a trend. I've had two other more unique experiences, as there are many TIA participants. Ten years ago, the University System of Georgia asked me to be the investment consultant for their defined contribution retirement plans. This is a 30-unit system, and it contains flagship schools like the University of Georgia and Georgia Tech. But it also contains a large number of smaller in number schools with a different mission, access to education, and teaching being their primary goal. Every unit in the system is important. In these 10 years, I got to observe a lot of financial service providers. I will tell you something about TIAA that's different than the others. There's 25 units in the system that none of those other providers would ever go to to help somebody in a benefits office, to sort out paperwork. They're in rural Georgia. They're not in Atlanta. It's easy to go to Atlanta and find a lot of people to serve. It is not easy to go hundreds of miles from Atlanta to serve a small number of people. But that's what makes us a system, and that's what makes 
it important to have someone who thinks about the greater good. Also, since 2007, I've had the privilege to serve as a research fellow in the TIA Institute. If you haven't been to their webpage, I encourage you to go. TIA Institute brings together scholars from, out, from, from the out, throughout the United States with top administrators from higher ed. We are looking to address some of the big challenges that higher ed faces and to help people who work in academic institutions to make good financial decisions. I've had the privilege to work on two projects. One, helping to increase the engagement of younger workers who enter our universities, helping them to get into retirement plans, helping them to think about making good decisions about their insurance. I've also had the privilege of working on a project to think about faculty retirement. Higher ed is under significant stress, facing challenges we've never faced before, and it's entities like TIAA that care about us that make that important. So that is the TIAA that I know and that Roger Ferguson leads. We now have the opportunity to see him engage with Dean Kreit in a discussion about that leadership. So please join me in welcoming Brent Kreit, Dean of the Daniels College of Business to the stage. Now join me in welcoming Roger Ferguson, President and CEO of TIA. Thank you. Thank you. Conrad, thank you very much for that. Conrad's been with us for about three months, and as you uh, maybe got a sense of, um, Conrad is a, a prolific and active scholar, uh, a thoughtful and contributing colleague, and a wonderful addition to the academic community at Daniels and at DU. Um, Roger, welcome. Thank you. Um, we have... Um, uh, asked a lot of you and your colleagues today. This is round two for you. Um, <laughs> I know you were on campus earlier with some of our other colleagues. Um, let me just express our gratitude. Uh, we are delighted to have you here. Looking forward to the, to the discussion. We had a chance to spend uh, just a few minutes together uh, earlier. And as I said, I've, I've been, a, been a fan for a while. So this is, this is a real treat and, and only slightly intimidating for me. So, uh, <laughs> well, thank you very much for giving me the chance to uh, chat with you and interact with the audience over time. So um, we're going to um, sort of meander through an eclectic mix of, of questions and topics and talking about your journey and leadership style and the organization and markets. Um, but I want to start off, if you will, you were, you were quoted um, somewhere saying that you currently have the uh, best job in the world. I can sort of relate to that. I had the best job on campus. Um, <laughs> TIA is about to begin, um, have its 100th anniversary in yeah. 2018. You've been with the organization for 2008. Right. Tell us what makes the organization special. Tell us why you are so uh, excited about what it represents. And let us know how you got there. Okay. Well, you've heard a bit of what makes it special, which is um, we are a mission-driven organization. Uh, our goal, our desire, our only purpose, uh, when we were created by Andrew Carnegie 100 years ago, is to basically create great financial outcomes for individuals and institutions in the not-for-profit space, with obviously a primary focus on higher ed. Um, we've done that uh, successfully. Uh, so one of, the great, one of the things that makes any company a great place to work is it's been successful at its mission. So we have been doing that. Um, we've paid out, oh, almost what, $395, $400 billion, more or less, of retirement uh, income from the first day to today. Uh, and we currently support about five million Americans in some place on their journey up to and through retirement. Um, for me, TIA has become, uh, if you will, uh, the centerpiece that brings together many threads of my career. And so for me, the reason this is the best job in the world is it gives me a chance to 
exercise, many of the muscles, mm. many of the skills, many of the lessons I've learned, um, almost from high school on through uh, to, the, to yesterday. Uh, so that's why it's really, for me, the best job in the world. And some of its successes are, and has grown to being a trillion dollars, uh, as you know. We serve about five million people. Uh, we have won the Lipper Award for the best large mutual fund complex five years in a row. No other institution has done it more than twice. Um, we are you know, one of the leaders uh, in ag. We are the second largest grower of, of wine grapes in California. We're the third largest uh, in real estate. I can go on and on. Hmm. So you know, having a chance to be associated with a mission-driven organization that reflects who I am and what I do, that also is of scale and successful, those are the components that make this a perfect job for me. Really appreciate that. Um, so you you talked a bit about um, the the organization's mission. My my colleague uh, Provost Kivas that speaks eloquently about the mission driven aspect of of TIA and and um, as as a member of a community who is deeply mission driven here at the University of Denver. You know I have I have full appreciation and and respect for that. On the other end of the equation. Um, you know, I recognize the obligation of um, shareholder-based organizations or for-profit organizations who are um, required to create, as opposed to mission accomplishment, economic value creation. And, and as powerful and as enduring as your mission has been, the fact is, with no margin, no mission. Um, and so give us a sense of how you reconcile the need to, to be a successful business entity uh, to affirm the principles of the mission and how you, how you reconcile those two? Well, for us, they're not inconsistent at all. It's a both and. And the reason that it's a both and is we have no shareholders other than the individuals who have uh, sent us their life savings. Um, and so we have to be financially successful in order to keep up with the promises, in order to live up to uh, the mission. And so there's never, never any conflict. And it really reminds us that we've got to be great stewards of people's money. And so when I look at the budget every year, when we look at all the programs and projects, we all are thinking, gee, is this really a good use of some retirees' money? And we all know uh, individuals who are you know, saving with us or retire with us, my aunt, my cousin, everyone in the firm can say that. Um, and so you know, it, it turns out that for us, there are no conflicts. We have no uh, you know, shareholders to serve otherwise. And we have to be financially successful because that is the mission. That consequently means we've got to look for a really good risk-adjusted return over the cycle. Mm -hmm. We've got to be broadly diversified. Um, and we've got to make sure that we're getting good returns on our investments, uh, even the, the strategic investments mm -hmm. that we make in terms of buying a bank or another entity. So it's all totally aligned. Um, and there are no conflicts, in fact. You know, I look at some of my competitors, some of the folks in the financial services world, and I think part of what's driving some of what we've seen is they have a conflict. They mm -hmm. have you know, the desire to serve or to sell, hopefully, the right kinds of products to their customers, but they also need to have a return for their shareholders. Mm -hmm. And those two groups may not overlap. And so what I think we've seen in the industry, frankly, is mm -hmm. the need to get that earnings for share growth every quarter may have forced people to make decisions that, in hindsight, over the long term, you know, aren't the best. We don't have that conflict. The company has its roots, uh, long, deep roots, in retirement um, activity. And yet, you've, you've recently made some um, purchases to diversify the portfolio. You bought Nuveen, um, um, other transactions. Is that, a, um, is that a result of the intent to continue to diversify? Is that a result of the, the market conditions that you need to, to stay competitive? What, what prompted the decision to sort of enter into what seemed to be uh, at least adjacent uh, yeah. markets? Well, what prompted the decision is the recognition that our mission of uh, creating great financial outcomes, getting people safely to and through retirement, cannot be a monoline mission about retirement only. Mm -hmm. If one thinks about the challenges that Americans have, young Americans, middle age, older, around saving, investing, and spending properly in retirement, a lot of those challenges go back to things other than that. Um, you know, that first mortgage, uh, paying off the student loan, uh, saving for college for someone, you know, all of that range of things in one's financial life 
has an impact on the ability to successfully get to and through retirement. And so with that recognition, we thought it is very important for us to be able to provide services uh, of our caliber that are you know, appropriate for the individuals we serve across both the liability side of their balance sheet and the asset side of the balance sheet and get them set up for great retirement by allowing them to do very well in all the other financial decisions that they have to make along the way. Um, and so we've invested in a bank that's an internet bank, uh, knowing that getting a good mortgage or a good loan is an important part of getting ready for mm -hmm. a good mm -hmm. financial outcome. And we invested in Nuveen because they have a very, very strong um, investment track record in areas that are adjacent but important to mm -hmm. us, for mm -hmm. example, they're one of the leaders, if not the best name in munis. Well, it turns out that for many retired people, getting tax advantage income through munis is one of the right. things that they do to supplement their income. So it's all of a piece, and it all really starts with the notion of getting people safely to and through retirement is more than just retirement savings. It's all the other financial decisions they make in their lives. The, the internet bank to which you refer to is Everbank. Is Everbank. Uh, right, right. Um, Give, give us a sense of um, how well this country um, has or, or has not um, addressed issues, and you mentioned it at least tangentially earlier, uh, uh, addresses uh, issues of financial literacy in primary school, uh, middle schools. Um, you know, as a, as, a, as a business school dean, um, you know, uh, so if I was university czar, uh, everyone would have to take an accounting course, um, probably two of them. Um, so Greg, that means I need more accounting faculty. And um, you know, we were sort of horrified at, at the um, financial um, meltdown in 2008, and, and I, I felt that much of it was a result of the lack of uh, financial sophistication and understanding um, debt and compound interest and pretty basic ac activities. Basics. Give us a sense of your view of what we need to do better as a country to ensure more uh, literacy uh, among our citizens. Well, first, the fact is, as you point out, that the degree of financial literacy in the U.S. is you know, horrifically low. Um, uh, compound interest, the impact of inflation, uh, broad diversification and in investments. There are many tests that we've uh, given or others have given that shown the average American gets the answers wrong on some basic questions. Um, part of the reason, frankly, is that I think now it's about only half the states, maybe a few more, have any kind of financial literacy training mm -hmm. required in schools. Uh, and that has a compounding effect, which is if you don't learn it yourself in school, you can't teach it to you know, your kids. Um, and so we are confronting a real challenge. I fully agree with you uh, that the absence of financial literacy is one of the underlying causes for many of the challenges that we've mm -hmm. confronted. You know, people you know, getting over their head in debt, people uh, ignoring that basic rule that it sounds, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably right. is right. too good to be true. One of the things I learned when I was at the Fed that had been focused on this issue is part of the challenge in the classroom is that our faculty, our teachers themselves, not your faculty, but our grade school and high school teachers themselves aren't very financially literate. Um, and so, you know, if you don't feel comfortable standing in front of the classroom, you're not going to stand in front mm. of the classroom. Um, and so what we learned at the Fed is we've got to sort of cycle back and figure out how we educate uh, the teachers who can then educate the students. There is some good news, though, which is, I believe, newer technologies, uh, things called gamification, which your younger folks mm -hmm. know about, uh, may well be you know, a, a tool in this space. Um, so the internet, these various communities that exist in virtual space, uh, plus the learnings that we know about behavioral economics may be helpful. Thank you. Um, we've got a lot of students here, as, as well as other members, and I don't want to assume their um, views on the, on, on the Fed. But for, for many individuals, um, you brought up your, your um, a relationship with the Federal Reserve, it, it, it is an opaque, uh, sort of secretive structure, and, and lots of folks aren't, aren't particularly clear on, on its purpose. I wonder if you might just give us an overview um, of its primary role. And my understanding is that you were the only um, Federal Reserve governor 
in DC on 9-11. I'd, I'd, I'd like for you to share that experience as well, as you provide a, a, a brief primer on, uh, <laughs> a brief primer. on the uh, All right, so let me start with, with the Fed. So the Fed was created in 1914. Uh, it was created by an act of Congress. Uh, and it was created in response to one of the great financial crises that the U.S. has had before um, the, the Great Depression, probably the worst before the Depression, which was the 1907 um, uh, crash. Um, the theory of the Fed is that it is uh, uh, the central bank that stands behind um, ultimately all the other banks by being able to lend to banks and keep uh, the country of memory run on the bank. Um, the primary tool that it uses is much understood, which is uh, interest rates. Folks generally understand interest rates. And what the Fed does is basically, um, uh, through buying and selling security, sets interest rates at the very, very short end of the yield curve. I'm talking to a group here at the business school, so they understand what that is. Um, the Fed has been opaque historically uh, for two or three reasons. One is what they do is, you know, highly, is relatively technical, and, and in that sense, even if they try to describe it, it may not come across as being intuitively obvious. Secondly, frankly, uh, there had been a theory of central banking, um, which was that one should be opaque, that the market shouldn't know what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third, frankly, is the, you have a consensus-driven group that has many people who can speak, um, there are reserve bank presidents, there are governors who sit in Washington. Um, and so with the possibility of 19 people talking at any one time, mm. you're not going to get necessarily a smooth, simple, symphonic message. It's going to sound more mm -hmm. like a cacophony. Mm -hmm. And so that, that creates confusion and the perception of, of uh, opaqueness. Having said that, um, I'm proud of the fact that I was one of those who started this path towards uh, greater disclosure. Um, uh, under my leadership and when I was the vice chair, we decided to issue a statement after every meeting explaining what we did, and things have gone on past that. So it is working hard to become much more um, uh, transparent. Um, but yet, we also have to recognize it still works in sort of a highly technical area, and so trying to make it um, uh, as simple as other things may, be, may not be uh, doable. The 9-11 story, um, you know, what can one say? Um, obviously the most traumatic day in American history. Um, the largest number of American citizens died on that day, I believe, ever in history, even if you think about some of the really bloody Civil War battles. Um, it fell to me to, in the midst of all that chaos, to help lead the team and decide two or three things First, what were we going to do to make sure that um, uh, the tragedy and the loss of life that hit New York and Washington did not spill over into an economy that was already weak? And the second thing was, what are we going to say? Back to your point about being opaque. It was clear to me that we had to say the right sets of things so that the things that we were going to do would have the desired impact. Um, and the very, very good news is we said a few simple things. The Fed was going to be open and operating, mm. um, and we'd be prepared to provide liquidity effectively is what we said. That turned out to be enough. And then we acted very aggressively through all of the tools available to the Fed um, to provide enough liquidity, frankly, to float the U.S. economy for three days, uh, building a balance sheet that was until recently the largest ever in the history wow. of, the, of, this, of the system. Many, many more stories to tell. You know, there are things out on the internet, et cetera. Hmm. Um, but the main thing was it was a moment that called for technical knowledge of how the Fed works, some leadership skills to get everyone in the system aligned, and then the ability to communicate um, some things that could have been opaque, but in a relatively simple and compelling manner. Um, and you know, fortunately, you know, it all came together at a moment when uh, the nation really needed things to come together for us. I, I really appreciate that, and I'm, I, I wasn't sort of going to get into sort of leadership style um, and your leadership journey now, but but I'm, I'm compelled to just just hearing that. I have to imagine that um, 
your response then, your capacity to, to discern through uh, conflicting and myriad of, of data during that time, I would imagine that it yielded some, some um, pretty important leadership lessons for you. And I'd just be curious as to what, sure. what, what those were, what you learned from that experience, and how has that affected your, your success and growth uh, since, since that time? Well, there's no doubt. And the most important leadership lesson was you can't be a leader if you're not going to have followers. Mm -hmm. right? If you think you're a leader, you look over your shoulder, no one's there, you're not a leader, you're sort of a clown. Right? And you know, there's a subtle difference between leadership and clown-like behavior. Um, and so the, I think the major lesson for me was, OK, if you're going to be in a position to lead, you have to figure out what are the three or four skills that you need in order that people want to follow you. Um, because you know, every organization, even the military, and I've heard this from generals, is really about a willing followership. You cannot command loyalty and followership, um, full stop. And, and this came through on 9-11 in many ways. The four skills that I think one needs in order to be you know, a good leader, i.e. in order to incent and encourage followership are expertise. So if I think back to 9-11, if I had no idea how the Fed worked and how the monetary system worked and how payment systems worked, and you know, the importance of Bank of New York and all these things, we would have made a lot of you know, lousy decisions. Mm -hmm. you know, people don't want to follow someone who has no expertise. Now, your expertise may be highly technical, the kinds of things I've just talked about, or it may be, you know, how does this organization move forward? But you need some sort of expertise. The second thing, obviously, um, is you've got to have uh, the capacity to explain where you want to go. Um, you know, uh, somebody once famously described that the vision thing. <laughs> Now, sometimes that vision is grand and broad. You know, I want to lead TIA to get ready for the next 100 years. Sometimes it's I want to lead you know, the markets to heal as quickly as possible. But a clear sense of what is the purpose? Where, you know, what's, why are folks following you? Where do you want, where do you want to go? Um, the third thing is you actually have to have empathy. Um, I find it really hard. You know, mm. If you... Uh, are following someone, you want to have a sense that they sort of understand what you're going through. They are thinking about your interests. They're, you're not just a cog in their machine. Um, and certainly on 9-11, you know, people had personal issues. I recall well my own assistant getting phone calls from the Philippines and with people saying, get out of that building. I had to be very empathetic to you know, all the stresses in everyone else's life. Um, frankly, in that day, even in my own life, my, my wife, uh, who was in many ways my partner in doing this, uh, was a, the senior official at the SEC overseeing the markets on 9-11. So she was at work, I was at work, we were mm -hmm. in touch with each other almost hourly, and yet we had two small kids mm -hmm. at home. And so trying to figure out how to be stewards of our jobs while also dealing with our kids was an interesting set of you know, challenges. I don't want, to, you know, don't want to take up time about that, but it's sort of empathetic. Right. Point was, was point three. Uh, and the point four is if you're going to have people follow you, and this was true on 9 11, you've got to show a certain amount of fortitude. You've got to be brave. Um, you know, the, the path is not always easy. And people don't want to follow someone, you know, as soon as the path takes an unexpected turn, uh, who becomes panicky and, and unbalanced. And all that stuff came through on 9 11. Um, I wasn't able to articulate all of it at that moment. Um, but as I've thought about it, those were the three or four things that had a number of people willing to follow where, where we were trying to go. And I think those are the major tenets around right. leadership, right. as I see them. Oh, thank you for that. Um, let, me, let me switch gears for a minute and, and ask you to put your sort of market prescience to work. Um, can you give us, if you would, an outlook on your view of um, what you expect uh, monetary policy over the next uh, one to five to seven years to look like? And, and in particular, Roger, I'd be curious as to what you anticipate, uh, right, market prescience, uh, right. Uh, what you, what you, what you uh, anticipate its effect uh, will be on, on um, asset accumulation and money managers. Mm -hmm. um, so let me be quite clear. I have no idea what monetary policy is going to be <laughs> one, five, seven years from now. Um, 
I'm making sure it's going to be one, five, seven quarters from now. <laughs> uh, a couple of things seem somewhat clearer in, in what is otherwise always a murky situation. We do seem to be in a situation in which um, global and domestic inflation dynamics seem mm -hmm. to have changed. Um, there's an awful lot of talk, all of you see it, this is a business-oriented group, uh, where the economy is growing, it's, it's not bubbling along at, at what we'd like, but now that's growing steadily, s slowly. The global economy is starting to grow. Um, unemployment has come down quite dramatically in the U.S. and in many other economies. Um, yet, for some reason, inflation is missing. Um, mm. And because it's possible that inflation dynamics have changed, I think what that means around monetary policy is the Fed and other central banks will be cautious in gradually raising interest rates. What does that mean for asset managers? Well, the good news is that in a, in a world in which interest rates are rising only slowly, asset prices can continue to do reasonably well. Um, I'm not predicting that they're going to keep growing at double digits as the equity markets have been for the last few years. But solid, you know, single-digit growth seems to me the most likely outcome, absent any, any geopolitical shock. Um, so that's actually pretty good news for asset managers. Uh, it does mean, as, as uh, we are, if you are an asset manager that manages large amounts of real assets and alternatives, those prices also are likely to maybe wobble just a little bit, but not you know, come off dramatically. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so that's real estate, agricultural land, timber, things of that sort. So what I've just painted here is a, a relatively benign picture driven off of the thought that inflation is not going to uh, get out of hand and consequently central banks can be measured, it's a phrase they like to use, which means relatively slow in moving interest rates up, and that's a pretty, mm. a pretty positive story. Um, it may not be as, markets may not be as robust as they've been the last several years, um, but I, for one, don't foresee, you know, a dramatic crash, a dramatic correction. Things may wobble, not grow quite as much, flatten just a little bit, um, but I, I, I would consider myself relatively, I'd say, constructive, modestly optimistic, cautiously optimistic, mm. that things are likely to good, look good. Um, appreciate that. You, you mentioned um, just then the uh, robustness of the last few years in the market, and I think it's, I don't know, 34 straight months or 33 straight months. And um, I'm, I'm curious uh, if we could get a little technical there from you in terms of do you see anything on the margins to, um, you know, uh, rising consumer debt rates, um, you know, inflationary issues that you talked about, other sort of variables and conditions that might sort of uh, be things that we ought to be, be reflecting on at this point? Oh, absolutely. There are two or three things. Um, at a macro level, and one has been much talked about in the newspapers, there is a challenge around this very, very slow growth of wages, mm. um, both nominal and real wages. Uh, and since the U.S. economy is two-thirds driven by consumption, um, the fact that many households you know, aren't seeing the kind of robust picked up in wages that they would have expected in this kind of relatively tight, tightening labor market, uh, has got to be a source of concern. Um, one already sees that playing through in the top line growth of, uh, by which I mean sort of revenue, of businesses that are consumer oriented. Um, so that may have an impact on earnings going forward. So I would focus and think about that. A third um, uh, cloud on the horizon, if you will, um, is the fact that productivity growth is relatively low, which tends to dampen down the ability to increase wages. Uh, and then you're adding to that the big generational shift that's going on. And here I speak as a current leader of a, uh, the leading retirement provider in the country, with all of us aging baby boomers you know, moving out of markets, uh, moving out of the labor force. Um, and so all of those factors could play a bit of a dampening um, on any of the things I've just talked about, particularly in the U.S., but also in Western Europe, in Japan. Many, all of those factors are true in those economies as well. 
You add to it um, uh, the student debt burden that seems to be slowing down household formation for younger people. Um, and you, you have a, a bit of a, uh, a series, series of headwinds that may be negative. And finally, the thing that nobody can control, obviously, is you know, external shocks of one sort or another, mm -hmm. geopolitical risks um, emerging. You know, one takes note of Brexit uh, <laughs> votes in, recently in, in uh, Catalonia to break right. away from Spain. Right. Right. Don't know if any of that's going to occur, right. um, but certainly that is mm. not the stuff of great stability for long periods of time, we'll put it that way. Right. Um, thank you. Um, let me let me ask you about millennials and and Gen Z folks, both as as uh, employees and, and human capital, and also as a, as an increasingly vital market segment. I mean, at colleges and universities, we have to fundamentally sort of challenge ourselves to understand uh, how they want to learn, how knowledge ought to be transferred, distributed platforms and flexibility. They come with a different sort of maybe value set. Um, what does that mean for your, uh, your business, trying to lock in this, uh, this growing, growing cohort? So let me think about it first as a group of employees and then as, uh, as a group of potential clients, customers, participants, as we call them. Um, our millennial employees have been a complete breath of fresh air for us, I must say. Um, all the enthusiasm, all the creativity, et cetera, that you'd expect. We're very lucky um, because we're a mission-driven company, and so we've attracted a number of younger employees who are completely bought into the mission um, uh, and are challenging us to do better. Um, and so I get a most, much of my energy at work from interacting with the, the folks who are, who are in the younger cohort. We've got a very dynamic employee resource group called the Yo Pros um, that come to my town hall, sit in the front row, and are just, you know, the, all the excitement in the room <laughs> emanates from that group. Um, I have not found them to be you know, stereotypically demanding of you know, my job in the next three years. Um, uh, <laughs> except for one or two examples. But, uh, so right. I do think that we have been collectively maybe a little unfair to some of mm. the millennials. And I also don't see them, at least in my organization, uh, think they'll work for two or three years and then wander off to do something else. Hmm. But again, I think part of that is because we are, we are unique in our mission focus and we are attracted to people who really believe in what we're doing. As a group of customers um, in the financial services world, uh, two or three things come to mind. First, they clearly want to be approached differently. Um, and so one of the reasons we're investing in our web capabilities, et cetera, is to do that. Um, we've done a lot of surveys and find that they are actually quite cautious and conservative mm. around financial matters, perhaps because they came to maturity, you know, doing uh, the 2008-2009 time frame. And so we see that they are much more interested in saving, but a little more cautious around investing. Um, and they are interested in saving in order to, you know, have... Um, uh, the lifestyle choices that they want, the freedom that they want. Um, and so one of the reasons that we've been involving our company to be a more full-service organization is that you can't necessarily approach them with a retirement story first. You've got to mm -hmm. approach them with a solution story around how finances can help them meet their goals and objectives. Um, and the third thing I've noticed about them, or that the surveys have told us, is when it comes to advice, particularly in areas, um, even areas as complex as finance, um, you know, the notion of what, what are my peers doing you know, plays disproportionately well with them. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the things we've been doing is we've created a little community, um, online community for younger people, and we've um, um, videotaped a number of them telling their own stories to bring it to life, as opposed to having, you know, some older uh, advisor trying to lecture at them. Um, they listen to and work well uh, with each other. Um, so those are some of the things that we, that we see. But I think it's, by definition, very exciting. Uh, they are a larger cohort than all of us aging baby boomers. They're going to inherit many trillions of dollars. Um, and so we you know, have to learn how to mm. work with them as they're learning how to work with us. Right. 
Roger, um, you talked a lot about the uh, mission-based um, approach at, at TIA and how oh, this is really part of the institution's DNA. And so uh, explain to us how, um, how the culture of the organization um, is, in your view, um, a competitive advantage hmm. for the organization. I think our culture is a competitive advantage in, in a couple of ways. Um, first, because we're a not-for-profit organization and we serve you know, a group that is an affinity-type group. Um, you know, I think we really understand, if you will, both the strengths and weaknesses of the not-for-profit world. When people see us, I hope what they're seeing is, oh, you're also part of the not-for-profit community. We're not coming to this campus or any other campus to make money. We're, we are mm. you know, uh, brothers and sisters in, in the world of trying to do good. Uh, we happen to try to express that through superior returns uh, as opposed to superior teaching or superior research, but nevertheless, you know, that sort of uh, similarity. So I think that gives us a bit of a competitive advantage. I think you've heard a little bit in the introduction. Because of that, we're willing to go and do things in remote locations, small clients, et cetera, that a for-profit organization uh, would not do. Um, I think a second competitive advantage for us is we have in our DNA a recognition that we're working with people's lifetime savings. Consequently, we have to do two things very well. To have a long-term view, uh, and finance and investing, it's the long-term view that pays off. You know, Warren Buffett is the prime example of that. You know, the contrarian view, the view that says when everyone else is panicky, that's when I'm calm. We have the advantage because of who we are and what we do to have a long-term investment perspective. Uh, that plays through the way we um, um, uh, compensate our portfolio managers based on their three mm -hmm. and five and seven year mm -hmm. performance, not their three quarter performance. And so I think that's the second thing. And the third is um, we really have put a huge amount of weight on diversity and inclusion. Um, our company was the first to have an African-American officer of an insurance company in the 50s. It was a gentleman who was an actuary. Um, my predecessor, predecessor, Cliff Warden, was the first African-American uh, CEO of a Fortune 100 company. Uh, we have more than a third of our board represented by women, um, and we have uh, other kinds of diversity as well represented across the boards. And I think that's really important because we are serving a more and more diverse population. Um, and everyone has all the statistics about the percentage of folks who are, who are going to be diverse going forward in the U.S. And that is true on our campuses as well. So I think you know, a culture that embraces diversity and inclusion, a culture that takes a long-term perspective, a culture that has the ethos of mission-driven and being a not-for-profit, all of it actually gives us a comparative advantage. Um, uh, and we see that because we are highly ranked in terms of trust compared to everyone else in the financial services world. Uh, and because, as we heard in the introduction, you know, people are giving us their life savings uh, on the promise that we'll give it back to them with good returns. And we've been doing this now for 100 years. So it seems to me we must be doing something mm -hmm. right because mm -hmm. we're about to turn to our second uh, century, we've grown, we've had good performance, and we keep attracting really good people. Yeah, it's really an interesting point. You, you're right. I mean, financial services um, industries writ large do not um, do not rate well um, <laughs> from a general public perspective. TIA continues to be an outlier in that sense, and, mm -hmm. and no doubt has a lot to do with the values and the culture you talk about. Let me let me also I want to follow up on what you said about the diversity and inclusion. Um, Clifton Wharton, of course. Uh, before today, he was um, president of my alma mater, Michigan State, and, right. and um, a, a man who went on to, to accomplish great, great things. And so you mentioned the importance of inclusivity and diversity to reflect, at least in part, um, the, the, the rapidly changing market in which it serves. But um, are, there, are there other reasons that you all have such a demonstrable commitment to to diversity. Um, uh, tell, us, tell us about some of the other sort of motivating oh, well, uh, factors. That... So the other reason is, you know, all the evidence tells us, um, and I put on my economist hat, going back to a theoretical economist at the University of Michigan named Scott Page, 
that diverse teams, inclusive teams, make better decisions. Um, there's no doubt that getting away from groupthink and having people come at a problem from a different angle is really important. Having people challenge uh, the conventional wisdom is incredibly important, particularly if you're making the kinds of investment decisions that we're making. Um, and so even if we didn't think it was sort of the right thing to do in a moral or ethical sense, even if uh, we didn't think we were working with a more diverse population, we would firmly believe in diversity and inclusion, but you need both, not just diversity, but also inclusion, um, because it just leads to better outcomes. Right. Um, it's the right thing to do. Um, and that is true not just for our company, but there's a lot of research that shows that uh, on companies that have a third or more women on their boards, publicly traded companies, their total shareholder return is three, four, five percentage points above hmm. the mean in their industry. Um, so there's you know, plenty of data, not just theoretical, mm. not just abstract, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not qualitative, but also quantitative, that sec suggests that inclusive uh, organizations, inclusive teams, uh, make for better outcomes. Yeah. Um, let me switch gears um, uh, and talk about an article. I think we may have mentioned this when we had a chance to, to chat earlier. There was a wonderful sort of um, overview of, of retirement savings uh, data in this, in this country. I think the Washington Post came out with it at the end of the month. And, it, and I think it talked about um, one in five, almost 20% of um, folks at retirement age don't have retirement savings. And those that, that have it, the average savings for an American is $120,000, at least according to that, that article. Um, give us a sense, one, of what the long-term impacts of that is on, on just collective health and well-being of uh, increasingly large segments of this, this population. Um, and two, what, what we need to, to do to, to combat that. So um, there's no doubt that we are facing a savings challenge, a retirement savings challenge, maybe a crisis in the country. Um, my colleagues, former colleagues at the Fed have estimated that perhaps we have a uh, a shortfall of a, a trillion, two trillion dollars in, in retirement savings, unimaginably large number. Um, <clears throat> that is a result of three things. First, we have moved from a defined benefit world to a 401k world. And the 401k was never meant to be the primary retirement vehicle. It was meant to be supplementary, but for a variety of reasons it became the primary. Um, as we did that, the savings rate did not go up. In fact, the savings rate for many of the years I was in the Fed is measured by national statistics was zero, sometimes even negative. Um, uh, and uh, we can see that in, in the outcomes that you've talked about. And so I think it does mean um, that many people, as they get closer and closer to retirement, are going to be you know, a, more stretched than they had imagined. Uh, consequently, people will have to work longer. Not necessarily a bad thing. Um, now, whenever I say that, uh, my friend Rich Trumka, who's the head of the AFL-CIO, uh, reminds me that there are a bunch of people doing blue-collar work and pink-collar work who can't possibly work an extra day. And I'm sure there are pockets where that's absolutely true, but there are also pockets of folks who do what most folks in this room do and what you and I do. And you know, we can work past 65 to 70 and maybe even beyond. So we are going to have to take this increased longevity, some of us, in, in continuing to work either full-time or part-time. Um, we absolutely are going to have to adjust our expectations, mm. um, for sure. Uh, and the other thing that's going to have to happen, and this is very, very tricky, and the sooner we do it, the better, the core bedrock saving vehicle for everybody for retirement is Social Security. Um, and so the government needs to get behind that challenge and fix that problem as soon as they can. Um, and it, it is doable. Um, so that's another so implication of this lack of uh, private savings is we've got to sort out the public uh, pension relatively quickly. The final thing we have to do for younger folks um, is we have to remake the 401k type system to be more of a hybrid, taking the best of that system and the best of the historic legacy uh, pension defined benefit world and merging them together uh, and we can go through what that calls for but I think in addition to worrying about 
all this aging baby boomers who haven't saved enough, we have to worry about the millennials and recreate the financial uh, uh, retirement system for them so that they don't recreate in a negative sense the experience that their parents and grandparents have had. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I wanna ask you um, something a little more just sort of personal oriented. You, you've mentioned in, in past interviews and in some of your writing that you were really influenced by some of your early childhood experiences and that's what attracted you to economics and sure. financial services areas in Washington, D.C. Right. area. Mm -hmm. Give us a sense of what some of those experiences are and how they translated into your interest to pursue your, okay. your academic uh, training and your, your professional pursuits. Well, uh, the two biggest, three big um, uh, individuals that influenced and made me the, the, to go down, allowed me to go down the path I went down. Um, one was, and everyone would say this, right? You start with your parents. Um, my mother was a school teacher. Uh, for her, education was everything. Um, my favorite image of her is being, you know, seven and a half, eight months pregnant with my. Uh, my younger brother, her third child, and getting her master's degree from George Washington University, and she had been slaving through the summer you know, with all this pregnancy things going on, and got that degree, um, and you know that was a real inspiration um, to, to see someone doing that and not giving up while also having a full-time job. My father um, was, a, uh, in some ways, a highly unusual person. He was a child of the Depression. And the way the Depression influenced him, and therefore ultimately influenced me, was he became very interested in banks and interest rates. Hmm. And when most dads would come home and talk about the box score, the football game, my father would come home and say, look at these interest rates. <laughs> you know? and, and he had no money. He, had, he, he was a, a, a GS7, GS8 in the government for a, a variety of reasons. I mean, low, low level person but he'd take his $500 and move it from one bank to another for <laughs> a quarter of a point on that CD. Right. Um, uh, it was everything to him. Um, back to the financial literacy point that mm. we made earlier, I was really lucky in that my parents, particularly my father, felt very comfortable in the world of finance. You know, you would think the man was David Rockefeller, the way he talked about <laughs> and behaved when it came to money. Um, but, you know, that spilled over to me, because our dining room table conversation was about savings, investments, banks, interest rates, all that kind of stuff. Um, consequently, I know very little about sports, but I know a lot <laughs> about money. <laughs> um, and so against that backdrop, in 1966, um, uh, Lyndon Johnson nominated a, a name that may be familiar to some, but not most, a man named Andrew Bremer to be the first African-American, first black governor of the Federal Reserve. Uh, Andy was also an inspiration, though I didn't meet him until I was 47, 48. Um, but he had come through um, really hard times. He was a son of sharecroppers out of Louisiana, went on to get uh, a degree from Pennsylvania, taught at Michigan State for a little while. Uh, and I was 14, 15 years old, growing up in this household where we were talking mm -hmm. about interest rates, and lo and behold, there is, it wasn't so much that he was, it was both things. Here's an African-American economist, but it was also about the Fed. And I suddenly realized, my God, this institution, the Fed, I'd never heard of, they're the ones setting interest rates that my father's so interested in. <laughs> and so I had to figure this whole thing out. You know, that became, you, know, you can tell my body language, let's say, interested, maybe obsessed, <laughs> with economics, monetary policy, the Fed, all those things. Um, and I was you know, very, very lucky. I was a um, nerdy kid, for lack of a nerdy adult, so I was obviously a nerdy kid. Um, and you know, studied really hard and managed to get into Harvard, and mm. it was economics from day one. Mm. Economics from day one. Um, so back to why I love this job, because it's still economics, and investing, and interest rates, and, and doing it for you know, great people. Um, and so it was really my mother around education, 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 my father around, you know, 25 basis points. Um, <laughs> you know, he had me balancing the checkbook when I was in the seventh grade. Um, it was just absolutely amazing. And there was another person who was my seventh grade math teacher. Her name was Rutsky. I forget her first name. 
But the week of April 15th, we, the whole math class was around doing tax returns. So she made up this fictitious family and we did a 1040A, the simple form. I found that it's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you're laughing with me, right? You're not laughing at me. So anyway, you know, it, yeah. was, it was this highly unusual upbringing um, that made you know, finance and education just seem like, you know, of course that's what you're gonna yeah. do. Yeah, no, thank you for that. That's, that's that's fascinating. Um, so for um, our students and other members of the audience and maybe um, for those of us who, who maybe weren't able to develop uh, as definitively uh, our passion at 14, uh, 15, <laughs> give, us, give us a sense, if you will, of um, your view, attributes, characteristics, habits, that um, ought to be part of our, um, you know, habits of life to, oh. to you know, try to, to fulfill our highest and best aspiration as, as professionals. Uh, there, there are two or three things. I, I'm, a, I'm a former McKinsey consultant, so everything starts with three, right? There, <laughs> there are three things. Even if they're five or one, right. you start right. with the right. three. <laughs> so there are three things. Um, one is curiosity. Um, and if you are a continuously curious person, you will end up being a continuous learner. And we economists would say that you'll continue to invest in your human capital. Uh, so I think if you're going to achieve whatever your you know, highest principle, your highest goal, your highest uh, capability in the world, you've got to continue to invest in your human capital which means you've got to be curious, you've got to be open, you've got to be willing to learn. Secondly, you've got to be willing to take reasonable risks, not crazy risks, but reasonable risks. Um, and consequently, that means you also have to be prepared to fail, because if you take reasonable risks, sometimes it's not going to work out, uh, and then bounce back. So you've got to have resilience, um, back to one of the earliest statements I was making about leadership. Um, and so I think that's you know, really, really important. And the third thing, frankly, is you've got to have humility. Um, everyone in this room is really lucky. You live in an environment of really smart people. If you think you're the smartest person in the room, you know you, I know you're wrong. Um, uh, and I don't even know what rooms you're in. Um, but humility is really important because that's how you learn from other people. You know, if you're curious and you're listening and you're humble, then you'll figure out, I can learn something from that other person. So back to my story about mm. Love Now Millennials, I just learned so much from them. Not that they've had, you know, I've been working 35 years now. Um, they don't have 35 years of experience, but they've got different experiences. And, you know, the ability to listen allows me to learn. Mm. And if I thought I knew everything, then it would be a, you know, a real problem. And I've been in rooms uh, with people who think they're the smartest people in the world. And some of these are names that you would know. Uh, <laughs> and at some point, their sense that they're the smartest people in the world has undone them hmm. against their big, big aspiration. You know, right. There was some job that somebody wanted and he or she didn't get it because people got tired of dealing with someone who thought he was the smartest hmm. person in the world. The absence of humility, I think, will invariably um, preclude you from getting to whatever yeah. that top rung right. is right. That, that, that you aspire to achieve. Right, right, yeah, thank you. Um, one more question and then we're gonna, we're gonna open it up for our, our audience. And I, I wanna ask something that you actually, you, you touched upon, uh, I'm curious about it. Um, you mentioned um, failure and um, I, I, I wonder if you can help us get a sense of, of um, some of the failures that you've had to um, reconcile with and throughout your career. And if you could give, more importantly, some, some pointers, particularly for some of our, our younger members of the audience, our students, millennials, just um, some traits uh, to enable us to, um, one, recognize and value failure, and more importantly, 
to, to withstand it mm -hmm. uh, in the course of our, our lives and professions. Sure, so, you know, one of the, like anybody else, I have lots of failures. I'm not sure why you want me to disclose them in front of our audience. <laughs> <laughs> a friendly conversation goes, well, tell us about how you failed. Right, 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 right. I'm just, I'm just no, trying to do the, what I can up no, here, No, I'm man. completely relaxed about it. Um, so the, the, the biggest professional failure I've had um, was when I was a very senior associate at McKinsey. And that's when the pressure's really on. Mm. You're, gonna, you're gonna have to show that you can ready to be a partner. Um, and I, I will never forget this. I was doing, uh, I was leading a study around a, a company that wanted to acquire a small bank on the West Coast. And I asked one of the associates to sort of model this out. Right? This, this is basic Excel spreadsheet right. to figure out uh, what their balance sheet looks like. You figure out the cost of capital, the cost of their uh, liabilities, and you know you can figure out what's called the net interest margin in, uh, for the bank. It wasn't that hard. Um, and I went off to do something else with another associate. And I did not check the work that this young associate mm -hmm. had done. And consequently, we presented to the client something that was not accurate. And this was on my shoulders, mm. no doubt about it. Because um, the job of the senior associate is to be the quality control person right. Right. Uh, to show that you can do that if you want to become a partner. That slowed me down in the partnership uh, decision at McKinsey by a couple of years. It forced me to take a slightly different path forward. I ended up becoming um, a partner, but I had to rebuild a lot of trust and relationships and. You know, there's some folks who, uh, you know, who had appeared to be in my corner who were suddenly in somebody else's corner. Hmm. Uh, appropriately so. Um, uh, and, you know, so be it. That's, that's the way McKinsey works. It's an up or out kind of place. And every couple of years, you're up or you're out. And I was pretty lucky that, you know, I was in this purgatory thing where I was neither up nor out and finally got back into, you know, the good hmm. graces of enough of the partners that I got into the partnership. Um, what are the characteristics that it takes to come back from that? One, just be honest, you screwed up. You know, I could have easily said, that associate, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> what, what, what's that? I mean, does that hmm. seem like the right thing to do? Right. Right? It's my job. This was a, people make mistakes. It's your job if you're in the quality control role to do quality control. So take personal accountability. We have six values at McKinsey, at uh, TI, we just did a values refresh. I insist that personal accountability be one of them. Um, so take personal accountability. Two, recognize, I know who said it, I think Churchill said it, um, success is never a final, failure is never fatal. All right, so, you know, maybe I was or wasn't gonna be a McKinsey partner, but this was not the end of life. Uh, and so, you know, show some resilience, come back, figure it out. The third lesson from that is to recognize that careers are not climbing ladders. People talk about a career ladder. A ladder is, if it's well constructed, totally vertical, one rung after the other, evenly spaced, you know, easy peasy climbing up a ladder. Easy peasy is a technical term. <laughs> Careers are rock climbing walls. You know, you go over here to the right, you get a good handhold, and then you move back over to the left, and guess what? You, know, you have a failure, perhaps, and you have to come back down and go a different path. So if you see careers as rock climbing walls in which the path is not clear, then a failure is part of the process. It's not the end of the process. So take some accountability, you know, be a little tough and resilient, and recognize that you know, failure is not fatal. It's, it's sort of part of a process. And then, frankly, you then have to figure out, okay, how do I regroup? And so I had to figure out, okay, I, I've angered, anger doesn't quite describe it, <laughs> but in polite company, angered a fairly senior partner, McKinsey, by embarrassing him by not doing quality control. He's not in my camp anymore. Let me figure out who's gonna be. Hmm. Um, and, and so you then have to be strategic about how you're gonna come back from failure. But, you know, it's gonna happen. I don't know anyone who's successful who hasn't had many failures, and lots of folks who are successful never admit to having a failure. Um, and you know, my 
learning about that is take accountability, recognize as part of the process, and figure out how you're gonna come back because you know, it, it really is not fatal. It is just a little bit of a blocking on the, on the rock climbing wall of life, right. if you will. Right. Does that make sense? I don't Absolutely. Know. Yeah. Thank you. Don't ask um, me that question again. Okay. <laughs> Right, right, right. Touche. Uh, so we, we've got some mics, or we've got a couple of mics. Uh, want to open it up. We've got a few minutes for um, some audience questions. Hello. Thank you for being here this evening. We appreciate it very much. I wanted to ask you a question as a student of behavioral economics and gamification, how it is that you um, see using that, those strategies at TIA and oh. what your, uh, your vision is for that. So, uh, look, I, um, I've learned from dealing with um, a number of young people, including um, some young entrepreneurs, uh, that one of the best ways to engage millennials and maybe other people uh, in a learning process is to create, frankly, a little bit of competition, maybe internal competition, maybe with another team, you know, friendly. Um, but it actually does turn out that winning, you know, chips, winning, you know, the ability to go to the next level seems to be, frankly, um, a good way to teach people. It, it is almost, almost addictive, frankly, um, in a, in a, a hopefully a positive way. And I don't know if you've observed anyone who gets into some of these games um, that are out there, but, but you know, winning little electronic things seems to create incentives by, for folks to do this. And you know, psychologists have understood this for a long, long time. And so one hopes that leveraging that desire, uh, the natural human instinct to play games, to things around finance will help people to overcome this financial illiteracy. And so I'm hoping to leverage it that way in bringing financial literacy to new folks and frankly, hopefully reminding them that it's coming from TIAA and therefore you know, creating a, a bond of affinity to them. Does that, does that make sense? Is that responsive to your question? Thanks. Questions up here? Yeah, yeah what, what's your perspective on the apparent concentration of certain sectors of the economy into ever fewer but larger institutions, banks, pharmaceuticals, insurance companies, et cetera, and what's that bode for our economy? Um, that, boy, that's a question that goes back to a guy named Gardner Means and Adolph Burley in the 1930s for economists that we know Burley and Means, I think. Um, I think the question of concentration depends on what drives it. We actually are in an economy now that has a surprisingly large number of uh, winner-take-all type industries. Um, where you know, if you're, you've got huge first mover advantages that you get to scale very, very quickly and become the industry standard um, in some ways, sort of the way AT&T did. Um, we have an economy in which, uh, let's take pharmaceuticals. Those companies make you know, multi-billion dollar bets on new, pharma, uh, new pharmaceuticals. If they win huge returns for as long as the patent allows them, if they lose, you write off two or three billion dollars. Um, you know, think about what happened in um, some of our major mining companies. They made huge bets on mines in Brazil and other places. Uh, the economy turned, and you had a huge turnover in CEOs uh, at Anglo-American and other places. So the second thing I think is driving this is just the amount of capital that has to be employed in very risky bets that pay off and I use the words bets intentionally. I mean, they should be investments, but sometimes they really blow up. Um, and that, that, that tends to drive economies towards you know, concentration. Um, so those are a couple of things that I think are driving this. It's a little different. No, it's, some of it's different. The winner-take-all thing is a little different from what we've seen historically. The need for capital in order to invest in risky ventures is not that unusual. And all that says to me that we continue to need to have you know, good regulation, frankly, hmm. um, the appropriate enforcement of antitrust laws, but probably modernizing them a bit to understand that the dynamics in the economy are also slightly different. Is that, is that okay? Questions over there? I'm having trouble seeing because we... Uh, over we can, here. Okay. Hi. Thank you for coming this evening and speaking to us. Mm -hmm. My question, I want to piggyback a little bit on what you said about being the smartest person in the room 
And um, can you maybe touch upon politics, policy, and the stock market, and what are warning signs that those of us who are investors should be looking for with so much uncertainty right now? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how that links to not being the smartest person in the room, but okay. Um, politics, markets, all right, and policy. All right, so let me start with um, one where I'm pretty sure what I think, and then I'll figure out what I think in the other ones as we go along. <laughs> On markets, um, I, I couldn't see it very clearly, but it sounded like the voice of a relatively young person. My view on markets is um, one wants to stay fully invested. Um, you have to understand what your risk appetite is and take really long-term perspectives knowing that markets tend to fluctuate up and down, but they tend over long periods of time because the economy grows to, do, to uh, increase in valuation. So the reason I say it is in fact, I think with respect to markets, for the vast majority of people, decide what your portfolio is gonna look like based on your risk appetite and to stay fully invested in that portfolio for as long as you can. And therefore, you know, being the smartest or the dumbest person in the room doesn't much matter because you've laid out a strategy and just keep executing it. And you know, I've been looking at markets on a daily basis. I must be getting really old because I'm starting to say things that sound like my grandfather. Um, <laughs> but I've been looking at markets on a daily basis literally since I was you know, 14, 15, <laughs> uh, now 65. So you know, it's 40 years, 50 years. Um, and they will be highly volatile sometimes. They'll be smooth sometimes. But there's this sort of a natural trend. And so I would discourage anyone in this audience or any other audience from trying to do market timing. Um, a lot of evidence shows that you'll end up worse off. And I would much encourage you to figure out your risk appetite and then invest consistent with that over long periods of time, not trying to, do, uh, not trying to outsmart the market in any sense. Um, with respect to politics and, philosophy and, and policy, look, I used to be a policymaker for nine or 10 years. One of the things I've learned about that is Policymakers are constantly trying to catch up with the industry. Um, industries are incredibly creative, dynamic, they move very quickly. Uh, by the time the policymaker sees what's going on, that's probably yesterday's news. Um, and so that does mean, while I'm in favor of really good regulation, and I absolutely am, um, it also means that we really need to have business leaders who are appropriately um, modest and capable of some forms of self-regulation as well. We've seen that absolutely in financial services uh, with mis-selling of goods and services, mis-selling of services. Uh, you know, stretching for unreasonable targets uh, has led to really bad outcomes. Um, so, you know, I can speak with some expertise about markets and some expertise about policy because I've been involved in both of those. Politics, I, I, I am no politician. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure what to say about it, frankly. Um, I think the reality is, as I've observed it, you know, politics is a really tough, tough business. And in many ways, I think we're not getting the best and the brightest going into public service the way we used to. Um, I, <laughs> that, was that comment an obvious comment? <laughs> um, no, but I, I do worry, frankly, about that, right? You know, Politics is where the rules are made. Um, you know, if you want to have relatively uninformed people making the rules that drive your life, then stay out of it. If you want to have informed people making rules that drive your life, then get into it. Uh, and that means at least voting, right? The, the voting participation here is remarkable, not here in, uh, in Colorado, but here in the United States is remarkably low. Uh, and too many young people are just completely you know, disconnected from it. I think that's really unwise. So X, what one thinks about the current crop of politicians, I think we all have to actually have to be involved in politics by at least going to vote. Because otherwise, people who are not as smart as you are are gonna vote, and you're gonna end up having to live with the decisions that they make. So that's, that's my, my point of view on it. Question up here. Okay. Um, TIA partners with organizations like GFLEC uh, for the purposes of financial literacy, and there are a lot of good tools out there, but there seems to be a systemic disconnect to get people to, they know what they should do, but to get them to actually do it instead of when it comes to keeping up with the Joneses. What do you think 
needs to happen to bridge that? Um, hmm. I think there, uh, obviously I'm struggling a little bit because I don't actually know what it is that stops people from doing what they know is right, except for the fact that we see that as a sort of fundamental human nature. I think when it comes to financial services, there are two, or financial issues, there are two or three things. Um, even folks who are reasonably well educated in other areas, even in finance, find that many decisions are, have a couple of characteristics that make them hard to deal with. One is um, a thing that's called risk aversion or loss aversion. People tend to overweight losses and consequently end up, I think, making decisions that are appear conservative, but in fact are the wrong kinds of decisions to make. Um, and that's sort of this, the nature of human beings. They tend to recognize the losses they've had and magnify those, and for some reason, a lot of the uh, psychologists and behavioral economists tell us that they uh, tend to underweight um, some of the, the wins. It's slightly different between the genders on that, frankly. And you can imagine between men and women, who are the ones who think that they are smarter and <laughs> are more confident in their investment capabilities versus those who are more modest. Um, you know, one of the ways that, that we can have learned to overcome this is by, and a variety of other biases in investing, um, is by using uh, incentives and structuring financial products in a way that overcomes the inertia, overcomes the fear um, that people have. And so um, an example of that is automatic, in, uh, automatic enrollment in a retirement plan or automatic escalation in a retirement plan or doing what we do, which is having people invest in annuities as they go along because those are really good for creating guaranteed income for life. And so my answer to your question is in some sense, knowing that people are gonna be fail, fragile around investments, even if they have pretty good financial literacy, a solution that the industry is emerging towards, in addition to things like gamification I've talked about, is to actually try to use the tools of behavioral economics to make decisions easier and to make them as automatic as possible. Um, and that, I believe, uh, will end up being very helpful. And in many ways, TI and CREF, our companion product, are the embodiment of, of simplicity, and you make a simple set of choices, uh, and you move forward in a more, much more automatic fashion. So that's the way I would try to come to grips with the challenge that you have, because I'm not sure we can expect people, even if they have more financial literacy, to necessarily make all the right outcomes or make right decisions, and so we need to structure um, uh, programs and uh, programs to make it easier for them and make it, frankly, automatic for them to get to the right places. I think we have time for one more yeah. question. Thank you for what you've shared tonight, Mr. Ferguson. My question is, um, between you and your peers in your professional circles, um, what do you perhaps talk about, fret about, project about when it comes to the future of national currencies, especially the U.S. dollar? and cryptocurrencies? Um, that's a very interesting question. So one, I was just in this conversation last night. What exactly is the future of cryptocurrencies? You know, to, to what degree do they actually have validity, if you will? Um, you know, are they currencies is, is a big question. Um, the other one is sort of related to this, but one of the implications that we've seen of globalization is that central banks actually don't have as much control over the shape of the euro curve as they used to. Um, you may recall, or you may not, some of you will, um, uh, Alan Greenspan in 2004, five, six, started to talk about uh, the so-called conundrum. Uh, my friend Ben Bernanke started to talk about something called the global savings glut. And so the, big, the other big challenge that sort of comes out of all of that um, is in a globalized world, savings and investment over in China has huge impacts on what happens in the U.S. economy and vice versa. Uh, and in the old days, that wasn't uh, so much the case. And so, you know, cryptocurrencies, are they or are they not currencies? What are they going to do? Big question. Broader question that you raised around effectively managing national economies through exchange rates, and I think what we discovered is that in a much more globalized world, um, it's really hard for any uh, central bank to manage all of the tools the way we used to. Um, yeah. 
that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just an observation about how, what people fret about, if you will, uh, in the way that you've talked about it. Does that, does that make sense? Is that reasonable? It's a, it's a close enough answer for the last question. <laughs> I can tell by your body language that's not quite. <laughs> we could talk about it a little bit more, but those are some of my thoughts on it. Roger, um, this has been such a treat. Thank you. Um, it, what, a, what good fortune for this campus to have so much of your time today. Really appreciate it. Please join me in giving Mr. Ferguson a warm round of applause. <laughs>